Hey guys, today we're going to be putting a new clutch in this 2002 DRS. Hey guys, welcome to another MTM video, the channel where we try to help you fix it through video. My name is Mark and today we've got a 20 year old Yaris that's in need of a clutch. So let's get to it. First thing we need to do is remove the battery. Now we've got the room to get out the gear selectors and we can remove them from the levers on the gearbox. There's little circlips holding these selectors in place. So what I always do is put the circlip back in its place, that way we don't lose it. Once you've removed the selectors and they're pushed to one side, you'll be able to get out the bolts that hold the frame for the selector cables. Once these bolts are loose, you'll be able to move the selector cables well out of the way so they don't hinder you removing the gearbox. There's various multi-plugs, wiring looms and pipes that are all bolted to the gearbox. These all need to be removed before we go any further. Once you've freed everything up and unplugged all the multi-plugs, we can move on to remove the clutch slave cylinder. On this one it's nice and easy, it's two bolts and the actual cylinder is placed outside of the gearbox. So this makes life a lot easier because when we remove it we don't have to bleed it later on. Once you remove the two bolts you'll be able to move it up and out of the way. Now that we've removed the slave cylinder it's very easy to see how it works. When you put your foot down on the clutch pedal, pressure builds inside this slave cylinder and it pushes out this rod which operates the clutch fork which then disengages or engages the clutch. Now we can put the car up in the air and remove the two front wheels. What we need to do is remove the hub from the struts and allow enough play for us to remove the drive shafts. These drive shafts can be stuck in the splines, so with a few taps of the hammer be careful not to damage any of the threads. Once the splines are free, you can help guide out at the drive shaft. Before we remove the drive shaft from the gearbox, first we want to drain it of gear oil. Also, by removing the gear oil filler plug, you can help the oil drain off faster. Goes without saying, never reuse the old gear oil, always put in fresh. When you're happy, you can refit the plugs and then we can pop out the drive shaft. These can be tricky and can be seized, so always be careful if you're using a lever bar in order to free up the inner drive shaft. I've seen people try to do this to a seized drive shaft and they've ended up cracking the gearbox. Once it's free, gently remove it. You want to be careful not to damage the seal on the gearbox. The drive shaft on the engine side doesn't have to be completely removed, but has to be popped out and then moved just out of the way so it doesn't hinder you removing or fitting the gearbox later on. Before we start removing bell housing bolts, I'll show you a trick. So with some old cardboard, draw a circle. This is our bell housing. So each bolt that comes out of the bell housing, we want to put into this piece of cardboard so we know where it goes. So with a marker point, I'll just write here, that's where the starter is, and I'll remove one bolt and just place it in. So now I know that is for the starter. This comes in handy because not every bolt is the same size or the same length. So it's good to keep track of where they go so that way there's no confusion later on. Once you're happy, you've removed all the top bell housing bolts. We can put the car up in the air and then support the engine. We want to support the engine because in order to take the gearbox off, we're going to have to take off the mount that's attached to the gearbox and also the stabilizer that's fitted to the rear. When you're happy the engine is supported, we can take out the bell housing bolts on the underside. This includes the bolt for the starter motor. Same as everything else, once it's free, you can move it out of the way. You don't have to completely detach it. Once the starter motor is out of the way, we can remove the rest of the bell housing bolts. Make sure you leave one bell housing bolt in place until you're ready to remove the gearbox. In my opinion, these bottom two bolts are the most awkward, just because of how little room there is this close to the exhaust. 
That's why I would always remove these bolts first before removing the stabilizer. When we remove the stabilizer, the engine will tilt slightly, and that'll give you even less room. Be careful removing the rear stabilizer. As I said before, when you remove this, the engine will tilt slightly. When we're ready, we can start to remove the gearbox mount. With this removed, all of the weight will be on our engine support, so we want to make sure that that is right before going any further. With this hanging loose, we can just tuck it up out of the way and it can sit on top of the battery tray. By supporting the engine from underneath, it means that we can adjust the height of the engine down slightly, just to make removal a little bit easier. A quick visual double check to make sure nothing else is in the way, and then we can remove that last bell housing bolt and remove the gearbox. With all the bell housing bolts removed, this is what the cardboard looks like now. We can see where all the bolts go and which direction they're fitted in. It's also important to put little notes so you know which bolts go where. Using a screwdriver to lock the flywheel in place, we can remove the clutch. Now that we've removed the old clutch, we can compare it to its new replacement. It's important to compare them just to make sure that there's no differences so that you don't end up fitting the wrong clutch. Also, we can have a check just to see how worn this really is and how far down it's actually worn. Comparing it to the new one, you can see how much meat it's taken off. And you can see here that the new one is almost double the thickness of the one that we've removed. By comparing these together, we know which way that we're supposed to fit our clutch split. If we fit it the wrong way, we're going to have issues later on and it's not going to end up working. Some manufacturers put markings on them that say transmission side or they are marked in some other way to let you know which way it's meant to be fitted. Using a special clutch alignment tool, we place this through the pressure plate and through the friction plate and we can adjust it up accordingly to make sure that it's in the correct position. The reason we do this is to make sure that that centre hole in the middle of the friction plate is in dead centre. That way, when we put the gearbox back into place, the shaft is able to engage through this and into the engine. If this friction plate isn't aligned properly, then you're going to have issues fitting your gearbox. You can tighten up the alignment tool, but not too tight. You want to leave just enough slack just so you can wiggle it around to put it into its place. You want to see and make sure that everything's even all around. When you're happy it's nice and even, you can tighten it up and then we can go and refit it back to the car. Make sure that the friction surface on the flywheel is nice and clean and then we can refit the clutch. Make sure that you line up the dowels correctly and then it should just slot into place. When you're ready, start fitting the clutch bolts. When you fit these, you should go, always go opposite to each other just to make sure that it draws in evenly. Remember, these are very important bolts and you don't want to damage them by over tightening them or leave them too slack. So always check your tech data for your torque settings. When that's torqued down, we can remove the alignment tool. We just want to give the bell housing a little bit of a clean just before we remove the thrust bearing. 
This is what presses against the pressure plate in order to engage or disengage the clutch. You can remove the thrust bearing just by helping guide it off the shaft and then releasing the clips. Clean up the shaft before fitting the new thrust bearing and we can put on a little layer of grease just to help it with its travel. When we fit the new thrust bearing, it can be a little bit fiddly just to get it into place, but with a little bit of patience, it should come. And you can move the fork back and forth just to make sure it's not catching anywhere. And carefully refit the box. Once the gearbox is in place, you want to line up the dowels and then run a thread just to make sure that the gearbox isn't going to go anywhere. happy the gearbox is flush against the block we can fit some other bell housing bolts. So with a few bolts tight holding everything in the right position we can now refit the gearbox mount. With this mount refitted we can carry on fitting the rest of the bell housing bolts and also put back on that rear stabilizer. You might need to put the transmission jack underneath the gearbox just to help tilt the engine into the right position. Once everything's correctly fitted, we can start refitting the drive shafts. You might have to rotate them so the splines line up, but also be careful not to damage the seals. you'll feel a positive clunk when it slots into its place. The outer CV joint can be a little bit of a tight fit, but with a little bit of guidance, you can help put it into the hub. Once you're here, we can reassemble the hub to the strut and also put that nut back onto the drive shaft. In order to top up the gear oil, I'm using a large syringe type tool just to pump in the fluid. And when it's full, we can refit the filler plug and give it a little bit of a cleaner. Then we can lower the car down and refit all the bell housing bolts on the top. Having our bell housing bolts organized the way they are really speeds up this process. When all the bell housing bolts are tight, we can start refitting the wiring looms and multi-plugs back to where they were originally fitted, and we can refit the slave cylinder. Again, some of these brackets can be a little bit fiddly to put back into place, but a little bit of persistence pays off. When you're happy everything is back as it was to begin with, then we can refit our gear linkages. Hopefully you've done the same as me and kept the circle clips in their place, otherwise they can be very easily lost. Then slap the battery back in and we're almost ready to go on road test. Remember, any wheel that you've removed from the car should always be correctly torqued before you go anywhere. 
inside the car, first thing we want to do is try our clutch. So yeah, it goes up and down, it feels like good pressure. And then try our gear selection. We want to make sure that we can select all of the gears to make sure there's no problems with our gear linkages. Then let's start the car and off we go. And that is it for this week's video, guys. We've just come back from a road test, so it's changing up and down the gears lovely, so I'm really happy with that. Guys, if you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications for when we drop a new video. See you next week. Cheers.